Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ignorant Intellectual on Media. Today, I thought we'd do another um, mixed haul. I got some books from uh, my uh, a bookstore that I uh, frequent. Um, I used to work at. I got uh, one, two, three, four, five, five books from there, and I got some books from thrift stores and uh, and some private sales. So I guess this is a mixed haul. I just wanted to go through it because I'm. I'm reorganizing a section of my book library um, that is uh, running out of space and too much stuff is piling up. So I thought I'd uh, get this video under uh, my belt and uh, then I can arrange that. Uh, maybe I'll show you the library that I'm talking about. Anyway, so um, let's save that for last. Let's do some uh, let's do some books first and then we'll go uh, on to movies and some CDs and then back to books. All right, so so this is a decision in Normandy, which is a part of the uh, Penguin's uh, classic uh, military history. All right. So this is basically, you know, what the Allies did uh, during Norm, Nor uh, the Norman invasion, the Normandy invasion, right? Uh, the Nor Normandy campaign. All right. And uh, it goes pretty good. It has image, uh, pictures as well. And, and uh, I thought this might be an interesting read or uh, I think I could sell it. So. So I picked it up. All right, it's got that symbol there. So if you see that symbol on on some penguin books, it's a military history, uh, you know, penguin, uh, uh, penguins military history, classic military history. Right? All right, so that's um, decision in Normandy. And I got another um, Arcturus uh, book, The Great Gatsby. You know, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's uh, greatest novel about the twenties. You know, the jazz and the swing age. Um, and um, it's about a, a what an ex military man from World War One who ends up uh, moving uh, to the south and ends up uh, befriending or kind of befriending uh, Jay Gatsby, and uh, it's basically his narrative on Jay Gatsby, the rich recluse, who's uh, you know his main uh, his, his main purpose in life is to pursue an ex girlfriend to get her back. What was her name? Daisy. I think it was Daisy. Yeah, Daisy. All right. So this is the part of the Arcturus collection. You know that collection that I'll, I'll get ten of them and sell them ten for thirty dollars because they're the uh, you know the inexpensive uh, uh, publishers of classic books. All right. So that's okay. Next up is I found this, which is cool. Um, the Divine Comedy, it's an older penguin. It's like, we have the present ones that are, that are like, uh, you know, trade paper, you know, they're, they're larger. They're not like paperback like these ones. Um, and then you got the ones before that were both kind of like trade paper and paperback. And then you have, uh, these ones, these ones would be the third before these, this version. All right. So anyway, so what penguin did was, uh, separate, uh, uh, Dante's The Divine Comedy into his uh, three books. And that, of course, is Hell, Purgatory, and Paradise. Um, and put out a book on each each one, right? All right. So these usually are like, you know, the older ones aren't... aren't uh, if I was to pick the older ones up, you know, the, this, this style, I, I would, uh, you know, I'd only really pick them up for... for uh, personal reading because to resell them it's not really worth reselling them you'd have to sell them at a price that you almost bought them for so you know putting up the ad and everything else would be uh you know would be uh the time wouldn't be worth the, the amount of money you would get back but this i picked up for five dollars all right these three for five and i think i can sell this for ten so um i'll make five dollars off of that ad which is which is okay now basically this is about um so Dante, uh, what's his name? He goes down into hell with, uh, what was that? Uh, was it, what was his name? You know, the old guy, uh, the guy from ancient Horace, not Horace. What was his name? Virgil. That's it. So he went, he goes down and, and, uh, uh, with Virgil into hell and he looks at hell and that's this one. And then he goes to purgatory, which is this one. And then at last he goes up to paradise or heaven and, that's this one. So it's basically Dante's imagination on what these three 
um, places look like hell for, you know, the ones that are punished for, for committing sin, uh, you know, a purgatory for all the uh, people that are up for judgment. But, um, you know, uh, Jesus Christ hasn't come down to judge the world yet. So they're kind of in limbo. So that's purgatory, really. Um, and then uh, paradise, which is where once you're judged, you get to go, right? All right. So um, it's one of the classics, probably the greatest Italian uh, literature ever written. And uh, I think I can resell this pretty good. All right. So um, next up after that is uh, The Road to Wigan Pier by George Orwell. Um, this is basically his, um, he ends up going up to Wigan Pier or, or that area there. And he, and he uh, you know, he talks to the coal miners who are, a lot of them are unemployed. You know, they're dying of a black lung and all that. And he's talking about, uh, you know, the, uh, the difficulties, let's say, of, of that kind of life and how it's uh, clearly wrong, right? So um, it's, uh, if you haven't read it, like Orwell, you know, most people will read uh, 1984, they'll read Animal Farm, maybe they'll read some of his essays, but you should pick this one up too, all right? So, and then we got Catcher in the Rye, which I've spoken about. Anytime I'll, I'll see this anywhere, I'll always pick it up because it sells really quickly. Um, I'll pick it up for two, sell it for five, and uh, usually I won't have it for more than a couple of weeks before it's sold. It's basically, you know, the poster child for teen angst with Holden Caulfield wandering around school and 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 uh, looking at uh, the world as a joke and, and parents as hypocritical and, and adults as, uh, you know, uncaring and so on and so forth it's uh you know uh salinger's greatest book and it's you know it's always it's always in print um all right so that's some books so let's do some cds now all right we have mia all right so mia's which one is this Kala. all right so this is i think her second album um and came out in like 2000 around 2000 2002. I should know this before I start the video. But anyway, so um, I used to uh, listen to a lot of music. In fact, I used to like exclusively listen to music, like basically get my education in music in, in the, uh, you know, from around 2002 to, to around 2007, 2008. I just basically read books and listened to music nonstop. Um, uh, just to get an idea of what music is out there. And this came up on the radar, but I never really uh, looked for her because it was more kind of pop stuff. But um, it was well regarded and its reputation extremely good. So I ended up seeing this in a thrift store. I said, okay, I'll pick it up and listen to it. And wow, this blew, blew me away. This, she's extremely good now. Um, if, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't already know probably. Uh, but this is this was my introduction to her, and it's basically extremely extremely fun. It's she uses like African beats. She uses she's like Sri Lankan, if I remember correctly. She's Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan, but she was uh, you know raised in, in in England in London, if I remember correctly. Anyway, so she's got that London accent, but she also used like uh, you know Eastern music, African music, um, dance, uh, electronic, all that mixed in and she comes up with something quite unique. I, like I've never heard anything put together in the way that she put this and, and some of her other albums together. If, if her other albums sound similar to this anyways. Um, and it, it's extremely good. So if you hadn't li listened to Mia, pick it up. It's, 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 uh, what, what does she say? It's banging, right? There's one, one bamboo banger is, is one of them that, that, uh, you know that, uh, but my favorite song on this is, is Jimmy. That, that, that's extremely good. So I listen to it on Spotify or uh, YouTube or whatever. I listen to uh, Jimmy. Tell me what you think. All right. So extremely good. So if I find any other of her albums, I'm going to pick them up really easy. All right. This one is really easy. This is Black Satan and the Sinner Lady, one of the greatest jazz albums of all time. Charles Mingus is one of the greats. This isn't my favorite of his. Uh, my favorite, I think, is uh, Mingus Aham, I think, probably. Um, this one is a little bit rawer than, than, than that one, if I can put it that way. Um, but anything by Mingus, you pick up, you're, you're listening to one of the greats of jazz up there with 
you know, uh, John Coltrane or, or, or Miles Davis or anybody else, right? Um, he had a reputation for being an asshole, but he did make some really great music, and this is one of his great albums, one of the greatest jazz albums of all time, all right? Uh, then we got Tragically Hip now for Plan A, and I think this basically came out after uh, Gord Downey's uh, death. It's kind of like, um, you know, some songs that didn't make other albums or whatever. Um, and uh, But I'm a huge hip fan. I think probably the Tragically Hip. It's probably between three groups. The Tragically Hip, Rush, and and um, the Guess Who was the greatest Canadian you know, rock band of all time. But I think I would give it to the, the Hip. Uh, that string of albums from their first EP up to, what was it, Road Apples, I think it was. Uh, so you got like Day for Night, Road Apples, and the... Uh, Another one, there was like three or four albums in a row there during the 90s, um, you know, late 80s. With, I think the late 80s was, was the first EP. And then after that, they had a string of albums that were just mind-blowing, extremely good. He's such a great songwriter. And he, he's not shy about his Canadianness, right? He doesn't, um, like, put it on the back burner in order to, uh, well, the whole band, anyways, put put it on the back burner, like hide it and, and, and do more generic songs um, to, uh, you know, please, let's say, in the United States or, or, or other countries that may not have any interest in, in, in Canadian, uh, you know, storytelling or whatever, right? But he didn't give a shit. He just did it. And uh, so many of his songs are like Canadian anthems now. So, and uh, they didn't make it huge. They didn't make it huge outside of Canada. Maybe that is the reason. But I don't know if that could be the reason because so many, like, like, Every 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 critic of every and every artist who ever talks talks about their art is you have to be authentic. You have to write about what you know. You have to uh, sing about what you know. You have to uh, you know do things about what you know, and then people will come along for it, right? Like if 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 um, let's say if you're Scottish and you're talking about your hometown, I may not relate to that because I've never been to Scotland, but you conveying it to me makes me understand it right so that's the interest so i'm not sure why uh gord downey is writing and his canadian you know a lot of the music is canadian right um why they didn't go huge internationally but anyways they're huge in canada and they're probably canada's greatest band all right so if you haven't listened to anything by the tragically hip uh i would suggest you do whether you're in or outside of canada all right so Living Colors Vivid, all right? So this is, um, it's funny because um, African-Americans basically created rock, right? You know, with Little Richard and, and all, the, all the guys back in the, you know, in the 50s. It came from the blues of, of the 20s and 30s, kind of morphed, and then uh, turned into rock and roll, and then it turned into, like, you know, rock, and then it split up into hard rock, and acid rock, and psychedelic rock, and all these different kind of rocks, right? Um, but it all started with, with, with uh, African-Americans, right? And but once it hit and it became popular and, and, you know, bands like, let's say, Led Zeppelin, bands like, um, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, all those kind of mor morphed rock into a white culture thing where you don't see very many, um, you know, uh, African-American or, or black musicians. You have Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix, but see, when Jimi Hendrix was playing early in his career, he never got anywhere until he went over to uh, England, right? Uh, once he went over to France and England, then he became huge, right? And then he, then the United States kind of accepted them uh, after that, right? But he had to leave the country in order to become uh, great. And I mean, there are snippets of of, of African Americans uh, in bands and and starting bands, but um, the only two that ever crossed my path uh, that I really got into was this was Living Color, all right. And especially this album, Vivid, and this came out in, what, the mid-80s, early 80s? Late, no, late 80s, right? Yeah, 1988. Um, and, uh, you know, Ice-T's uh, band, uh, Body, what was it called? Body Body Count. Uh, that's really funny if you've never listened to any of Body Count stuff, listen to that stuff, that's pretty uh, outrageous stuff, right? So, um, and Living Color is good. Now, uh, I think they made their name. What made them is... Uh, the song Cult of Personality. I don't know if you remember that. I don't know how old you are, but uh, if you haven't listened to Cult of Personality, listen to that song on Spotify or, or your, your your device, whatever you use to listen to music. 
listen to Cult of Personality by Living Color. It's probably the best song on this album. But they have like a Open Letter to a Landlord is another great one. And um, Glamour Boys is another great one. There was like th three or four hits on this album. And then they kind of disappeared. So you had to go searching for their music after this album for some reason. I'm not sure why. All right. So that's uh, Living Color. Vivid. All right. And now we have Suede. All right which is a uh, nude records. So I think from nude records, right? Yeah. From Columbia. Um, this is their self titled debut album. If I remember correctly, came out in the early nineties, 1992. All right. Now suede is kind of like the, the forgotten brother, right? Uh, it's like, uh, there was a huge, there was a huge, you know, there's a big Brit pop movement back, you know, in the, in the sixties with the Beatles and the kinks and, and others, uh, like a huge, you know, Brit, and then it kind of disappeared and you didn't hear any Brit pop, uh, you know, quote unquote, Brit pop music for the longest time until the nineties hit. And then it exploded again. And you had, you know, bands like Oasis and blur, they'd be fighting it out for the top of the charts and, in uh, great Britain or in the UK or whatever. And, uh, that would splash over to the United States and Canada. And, uh, you know, there was another kind of invasion of, of British pop music that came over, right? And, uh, you know, was, you know, like headed by Blur. And, um, but it was started by the Stone Roses. And you should, out of every album in, in the Brit pop movement, probably the Stone Roses self titled album is the greatest one. You got Oasis, you know, What's a Story, Morning Glory, and, 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 and a couple other others. You got Blur's Park Life and their self titled album. You got like uh, pulps, um, uh, oh, pulp, uh, no class. What was it called? Um, anyways, I'll, I'll show it here, and uh, and you have some others, but suede was was part of that. But they're kind of like almost forgotten for some reason. Now I listened to this album, and and maybe there was a reason for that because I did not like this album at all. It did not have that Brit pop kind of feel. Um, uh, I don't know. It, 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 it didn't strike me. So, but maybe this is not their best album. Maybe another one of their albums is better. So if I do find another album by suede, I'll pick it up and, and keep my mind open. But I did not like this album very much, but it's part of that huge Brit pop, uh, invasion of in, in the nineties, right? All the way up to the early two thousands. You had all those Brit pop bands that were selling millions of records, right? All right. Uh, what else? Okay, so I also found this, and this when I saw it uh, on Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace, I grabbed it right away, and that's the uh, complete studio albums of Leonard Cohen. All right, those are them there. All right. All right, nice box set, has every album inside. All right, you got a booklet, and you got number one album, number two album. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. All for Columbia. All right. So, so Columbia put out the box set of all these albums. Basically, you got. Basically, you got the complete discography of, of Leonard Cohen. Um, not, not his live stuff, but his studio albums. Um, all in one box set, right? So, anyway, yeah, I'm grabbing that. It's like over $100 on Amazon. If I remember correctly, I got it for less than half of that. I've listened to it. Now, I think I might do a, uh, a standalone video. We'll see, depending on my mood. Uh, on you know, ranking all of Leonard Cohen's 11 uh, studio albums in order. But basically, if I was to put it, it would probably be his first three albums would be there. Then um, uh, I'm Your Man, you know, from the 80s, 1988, and then uh, various positions. And then the other ones would, would go after that, I think. Um, you know, he's such a great uh, songwriter. He's like, there's, I don't know if you could call them a group, but there's like a group of, of, of male singer songwriters that have crappy voices. All right. But they make up for it with, you know, like the, 
just the complete coolness of of of, of their lyrics of, of you know like bob dylan can't sing with shit neither can uh, neil young his voice is just too too high and irritating um who else? Tom Waits would be another guy like that, and and Leonard Cohen would also be it. And he, if you've listened, if you start listening to Leonard Cohen's from the beginning, he has one voice, and as he gets older, his voice becomes more scruffy. I guess is the word for it, like uh, throaty. Um, it's like he 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 was a chain smoker, and and his voice has changed over time because of it. And his later stuff, he's almost whispering, right? So, um, but. You listen to Leonard Cohen because of the lyrics of, of, of the song, right? Um, uh, it's all about his writing skill. And he's created some of the greatest songs ever, period. Um, probably Hallelujah. Um, what else would be? Um, famous uh, Blue Raincoat uh, would be another one. Um, the Story of Isaac would be another one. Um, I'm Your Man is another one. Uh, First We Take Manhattan. Um, everybody knows, you know, that that's all from the I, I'm Your Man. Uh, anyways, it's, he has so many great songs. Um, Suzanne is another one. Anyways, if you haven't listened to Leonard Cohen, you're missing out. You need to listen to Leonard Cohen, all right? Just like you need to listen to Tom Waits is another great, you know, he's more jazz oriented. Well, Leonard Cohen has some jazz, and especially as it late, goes on later, uh, he has more jazz elements to his music, but it's his lyrics. Um, and uh, Tom Waits is a, a, another one that I would put up there with it, you know, along with like Neil Young and Bob Dylan and all those guys that just don't have very good voices, but, you know, they create some really good music and extremely good lyrics, right? All right, so look for that if you want to get all the, all the studio albums in one shot instead of go looking for all, all the individual ones, right? All right? So it has all of them. So I jumped at that when I saw that. All right, so let's do some movies now all right we got pink flamingo i just watched this while well, i just tried to watch this all right this is a that divine film uh john waters film john waters um you know this 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 became famous for you know the end scene there where divine picks up a, a piece of you know feces or or shit or whatever and then just eats it and it's real right she's actually eating it right um and you know she was like you know, the most famous drag queen, I guess you could call it, from the 70s or whatever. Um, it's a pretty brutal uh, film. John Waters is famous for that. It's one, I mean, I watched it, and the acting is crap in it, obviously. And, and uh, you know, it's just a shock. It's like a shock film. You want a shock film? Watch this. You know, I, I kind of stopped it after, you know, this guy kidnapped a girl drugged her or whatever with, with her, with his, um, wife, I guess you can call her his wife because they have a, uh, well, basically the film is about who is the, um, filthiest person alive is a divine and divine has this reputation in this film of being the filthiest person alive. And this couple, this couple doesn't, don't, uh, doesn't think that she deserves that reputation. They're the filthiest people alive right because they you know kidnap girls and impregnate them and then take the babies and sell them on the black market and then kill them or whatever right so that's you know that's basically the john waters thing so um you know and the grandmother of, of this family she she lives in a crib and never goes anywhere you know that's her right there in the center there all right um but i kind of stopped watching this film once it got to the point where the husband guy ends up kidnapping a girl well, the husband and wife ends up kidnapping, you know, chloroforming her and then um, knocking her out. And then he kind of like uh, masturbates on top of her and then takes a semen through a syringe and shoots it up her private park. I went, okay, that's that's enough for me. I don't really, uh, I have better things to do with my time. John Waters is, you know, is a famous guy. So I don't know what, the thing that struck me the first was because uh, in the opening scenes you had her the grandmother or whatever in uh in the crib talking about eggs she really loves eggs right and uh and i recognized her voice because i, I used to listen to uh what was the name i'll put the album up here by sloppy seconds it's it's like a parody of uh you know of uh kisses um detroit rock city album cover it's like a parody of it and uh, they have a song on it called um i don't want to be a homosexual 
All right. And uh, it's basically a song about a guy who thinks he may be homosexual, but he doesn't want to be homosexual, but he's not sure or whatever, right? Anyways, um, at the beginning of it is her. Her voice is in it, talking to her son um, about uh, wishing that he would, he would become a, a homosexual because it's so much more interesting, right? And he's saying he's not and he doesn't want to be. And then the music and the move and starts. I thought it was just a, a clip for the song, but actually it comes from another John Waters film with, with, with the grandmother in it. I can't remember the name of it. I'll, I'll put it here. But anyways, that, I recognize that voice of that woman. That, she was on that Sloppy Seconds uh, song. And I'm going, I thought that was just part of the song. But no, it's a clip from a John Waters film. So you learn something new every day. Um, but I wouldn't recommend this film unless you like to get grossed out. And anyways, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty nasty. Let's put it that way. But uh, that's its point, I think. All right. So I showed this film in a previous video, and I watched it. And this is an extremely good documentary if you have not seen it. Seeing those 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 guys that you hear about in history, you know, being being charged, uh, you know, with uh, crimes against humanity and, and and war crimes and everything. It's a uh, it's a uh, pretty uh, powerful stuff. And then um, I didn't know that they used so much video uh, for that trial. Um, do you think it was a show trial, the Nuremberg trials? What do you think? Do you think it was like, I don't know, it seemed kind of like a sh show trial, but it was like a, you know, a shot over the bow of, of, of future leaders who want to do war crimes. Now there's been people that have done it. And, you know, the international community taking after them as well, right? Going after them. Um, but, uh, yeah, it all started with the Nuremberg trials. Anyways, it was like, you know, you've seen Hess, you've seen, uh, uh Keitel, you know, all these different guys. And yeah, it's, and, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Olivier, I think, uh, narrates it, but, the most powerful thing is actually not because it, it's two discs, right? The first disc is the actual movie, with the trial or whatever. And the second disc is, is a lot of the documentaries or whatever that they used at the trial to convict all these people. Um, you know, their own films, German films or whatever, right? And, and you see, I mean, like, yeah, some of it's kind of like really gut-wrenching. And, you know, I turned my uh, head a couple of times just, you know, I mean, like you'll, you'll see a bulldozer. You know, uh, there's just so many bodies that bulldozers were pushing them all into these mass graves and all these naked men and women being children even being put. Anyways, it's like you don't really, I mean, you, you learn about the Holocaust in school and you learn about like the Nazis killed like, you know, six million Jews. and, and But you don't comprehend that number. And just with the film in this, in this, uh, you know, the. The second disc with the documentaries, um, the ones that they used at the trial, yeah, you kind of start getting the idea of what, uh, you know, like uh, the Nazi, you know, the final solution, they called it. Yeah, I mean, like, you have a whole new concept of what hu humanity is capable of when, when you watch those uh, videos, right? I don't understand. I just, I have no comprehension of why there, uh, when you look over history, why people hated Jews so much. Why do, why did the international community, no matter where Jewish people went, hate them so much. I just don't understand it. I mean, you, you get it in Shakespeare, you get it in, in film, you get it in, um, you know, with the Nazis, you get, I mean, I don't know why, why the hatred, right? I can never figure that out. So, but anyways, um, maybe somebody could explain it to me. Um, I know that the Germans or the, or the Nazis thought that the Jewish people were like, you know, animals, they weren't even human, but, you know, that's just propaganda, right? You want to bring a one race up, an easy way to do it is to take another race and look at it as subhuman and then uh, use it as an enemy. And, it, you know, maybe, maybe that's why. Anyways, um, this is a very powerful film, but it's actually this, the, the secondary, 
the secondary content that's on this, the second disc, is, is what will, um, you know, open your eyes and, and go, my goodness, you know what I mean? So, extremely powerful film. All right, so that's uh, Nuremberg, the Nazis facing their crime. And, and I just watched this one too, Hobo with a Shotgun, Canadian film, right? Starring Rutger Hauer, directed by Jason Eisner. Um, this basically spawned from, you know, the two you know, the Rodriguez and the Tarantino uh, Grindhouse films, right? You have like, a, you know, this faux uh, trailer for a movie, you know, that doesn't exist because, you know, Tarantino, um, you know, wanted to make the, the movie going experience when you watch it kind of more authentic of like if you're in, 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 in the movie theater in the 70s or whatever, right? So, um, and one of the faux trailers was Hobo with a Shotgun. And so then I, a Canadian picked it up and said, "Hey, let's let's actually do that movie, right?" So they did. They did the movie, and there's one. It's definitely an exploitation film. It's it's really gross. There's a lot of blood everywhere. Um, you know, acting is bad. It's like it's so bad it's good. That's what this film is. If you haven't seen it, it's basically he's a he's a hobo. Rudger Hauer he goes into town into this town, and this town is like. Sodom and Gomorrah, like it's it's led by a, a corrupt police chief who's under the uh, under the influence of, of a crime boss who does whatever the hell he wants, can murder anybody whenever he wants, and nothing will happen to him. And, and he decides, uh, the hobo anyways, decides he picks up a shotgun, decides to change the town and starts blowing all these people away, right? And it's just one blood fest after another. Man, the acting is so bad in it, but it's, it, it's fun to watch if you like a lot of red, let's put it that way. So that's hobo with a shotgun. So what I'm, all right, so let's, let's get on to the main purpose of this video is this. So this is called the Everyman Library, all right? Um, now the Everyman Library originally were smaller books, like the size of a paperback, but it's a hardcover. And, and the reason why the Everyman Library started was, was J.M. Denton's son, don't, don't quote me on that, but uh, a British uh, publisher said, hey, um, books are too expensive. Let, let's make a cheaper version, sell it for like a pound. All right. And, uh, that way an every man, you know, an any man, any man could, could afford picking up, you know, great literature. And what they did was they had a idea of doing a thousand book library, um, of all the great books and, you know, most of the fields in, you know, humanities, literature, psychology, you know, um, um, philosophy, that kind of thing and history and they put them in a, a volume of a thousand volumes and they published them over time, right? So they started back in like, what was it 1910, 1911, somewhere around there, just before World War One, if I remember correctly, 1907, something like that. Anyways, it was early 1900s and they, they hit a thousand, I think it was in the 1970s. So for that 60 year, 65 year period, they created that library and it's gone through different versions, but basically it's numbered on, on the bottom of the original ones. I have actually I have an example of one right here. Let me show it to you. All right, so here's here's Aristotle's uh, Poetics. This one is number 901 in 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 the collection. Now this is the last version of it. They actually made the the original Everyman libraries were were the size of this, and then um, halfway through the publication, they decided to make them a bit bigger, and so now they're like that size later on. And there was like two or three versions of this. Uh, when they went to the larger, anyways, but throughout the whole thing, they did the thousand, um, the thousand books, and then they stopped. All right, and then you never heard anything uh, from the Everyman Library after that. They had some paperbacks and things like that, college versions of, of paperbacks and stuff as well. But, but it it ended, and then what happened was, um, Random House, okay, had a competing um, library, and they called. There's the modern library. I don't have an example of it in front of me here, but and they started in the early 1900s, maybe a decade after the Everyman Library, and they started putting out volumes, and they got up to about 800 volumes, and then that stopped. The modern library stopped. You never heard of anything after the 70s of either of them, but Random House was originally called the Modern Library, and Random House was a side project of the Modern Library publishers, and then Random House kind of took off more than the Modern Library, so then. Um, uh, they changed their name to Random House, and Random House was the main um, business, and and the Modern Library kind of went on the wayside, right? So, but then in the '90s, what happened was um, Random House decided to buy the Everyman Library's name, 
all right? And they already had the modern library, and then they started issuing both um, in, in, in the 90s, in the early 90s, and they reimagined them, all right? And basically, they put out the, the modern library. They didn't number them at all. They just put out volumes of the modern library, just a bit cheaper than the Everyman Library, and the Everyman Library became more of a prestige type of uh, label. So you have the cheaper version, kind of along the line of the original modern Everyman Library. Uh, they usually had this like greenish silver. Um, I don't have a volume in front of me, that, but they got greenish silver uh, dust jackets, and they were usually, you know, in the twenty dollar or less range for for those books. And then then you had these ones in in the nineties, the Everyman Library, and these they numbered. But they didn't number them on the spine anymore. What they did was they numbered them on the title page on the inside. So if you see that, see it says 263, right? So they kept numbering these ones. These ones are up to like four or 500 now. There's four or 500 volumes in, in this Everyman library now. And this, I collect the modern library, the original, and, and the uh, Everyman library originals. I don't collect the modern library uh the 1990s version that's still being published today because you know they don't have numbering to them um but these ones still do and they're in the four or five hundred four hundred range now of volumes so i've been collecting these and i have i don't know how many of them i have but i have a lot of them and so the problem is is my space has gotten piled up and i had no access to to the the bookcase that these were in i finally got off my butt and moved everything out of the way and now i have access so so now I'm arranging them all. Um, so I thought I would show you the ones that I got just recently. All right. So we got uh, Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon, The Thin Man, and Red Harvest. You know, Dashiell Hammett with the, what was his name? Sam Spade. And then they made it a movie. You know, The Maltese Falcon. They made a movie with uh, Humphrey Bogart as Sam Spade. Anyways, you know that uh, pot boiler? What's it called? A pot boiler? What do they call it? A hard boiled crime novel. The original hardboard crime novel. So you have three of his books here in one volume. Um, what else? Okay, you got Jean Jacques Rousseau's. This one is numbered 84 in the collection. All right, so when the new Everyman libraries in the 90s came out, they originally looked like this. They had like a white face cover, but then when you turn them to the side, this part disappeared so it isn't a whole dust jacket it's only a front dust jacket right what would happen is it would disappear here so that you could see the spine of the original of the book itself right of the cloth book right and then and then the back you would just see the cloth right so it was just a little insert almost that kind of it flips around and and gives you the uh the description of the book but then when you come around this way it ends right here and then it shows the the spine of the book itself right so it looked really nice but how do you protect it? Because it, what happens is it'll get brittle and this gold kind of chips off and everything, right? So um, this will chip off and stuff. So um, so how do you protect it? So what they did was they took a pretty thick plastic sheet, cut it like a dust jacket, and covered the the paper part of it and covered the rest of it. So it's just plastic around around it. But the problem with that is is that over time that plastic um, yellows all right it gets yellowy all right and you notice everything turns kind of yellow over time um, with these volumes so what they did was they said okay that uh, people are complaining about that uh, let's do it let's do it uh let's change it and do it like this where you have the whole you know you have the whole dust jacket right that's what they did and there's like this kind of spine and there's that kind of spine and you know there's different colored there's like a red there's like green um, there's like purple um, I can't remember what the designations for each of them are green so this this volume is green right the the, the colors are a designation of, of something but I can't remember what they are this one is purple all right this one is red All right so um so basically if you find ones that are like this that have that white 
front, but then you put them to the side and you actually see the the spine of the novel itself. Um, these are the old ones, the, the original ones, the ones that came out first before they changed them. All right. They're still nice. Uh, I still collect them uh, as long as I don't have that number, right? So um, it's just you don't want to take the dust jacket off of it and put it on the shelf like this because the dust will just cover it. This black stuff will start chipping and everything. But the paper in it, the paper is very nice. Um, and it gives you a cloth uh, bookmark, a ribbon bookmark to keep your page so you don't need a bookmark All right so uh so yeah they're very nice volumes and so i collect them um i think i'm in the probably 150 range i'm guessing but at least 100 of them i think i have now so the best of pj uh Wodehouse, all right he's uh he's like the uh uh, what's uh, Stephen Leacock of, of 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 Great Britain? Basically, it's like uh, he's a humor writer. He likes to poke fun at 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 the upper class, the crust, the upper crust of of you know English society, right? So, um, and his stuff is pretty hilarious if you haven't read it. So, um, and you got Jean Jacques Rousseau's Confessions. Rousseau is one of the great philosophers, French philosophers. You, uh, you know, you you read him along with Locke and and, and Hobbes and you know, like Plato and Aristotle and all that for like uh, uh, political philosophy. But this is his autobiography. It's called uh, Confessions. It basically uh, goes through his life. And um, uh, it's an interesting read if you have not read it. And then you have Robert Louis Stevenson, the master of Melantre and Weir of Hermiston. All right. And this one is numbered. 106 in the collection. All right. And then you got Dostoevsky's greatest novel, which is number 35 in the collection. So this one probably when it was originally put out was was like this one. And then they republished it later on and they put the white, white spine on it, right? These are much beautiful. I like these ones a lot better than these ones, but what can you do? Um, anyway, so uh, this is uh, Dostoevsky's greatest book, at least. I think Notes from the Underground is pretty good or whatever, but um, Crime and Punishment is probably his magnus opus, I guess you would call it. Basically about what Raskolnikov was the main character, and he thought of himself as a special person. You know, there's a group of people that, um, you know, like are kind of like Superman, like what Nietzsche talks about, right? Um, uh, that are just above everybody else. So, uh, you know, the regular morals of, of these, let's say, sheep don't apply to them. And he decided to uh, to test that theory by killing a, a, a really uh, a, an older woman who he did not like. And then he didn't realize how much guilt and everything else and, and paranoia he would end up having because of it. So uh, his, his, uh, his theory was kind of debunked in, in, in the book. But anyways, it's, it's a, it's a great book. It's, I had a bit of a difficult time reading it because, um, well, most Russian literature is hard to read because the translations, I don't think I've, I've, I've read a Russian novel in translation that wasn't difficult to read, but people, I mean, like when it comes to a uh, literature, a lot of people really like reading the Russian literature and crime and punishment is like one of the big ones, right? So if you haven't read it, you need to read it. Um, so that's those. Then I had Aristotle's poetics, which is basically what one of the first Liter literary criticisms. He basically goes through what makes a good play, I guess, like a drama, like you're you're writing a drama or whatever, and he talks about how you can accomplish that well or whatever. And uh, you know, it also has Demetrius's on style and Long Longinus's on the sublime. So it's like three early uh, literary criticisms and. I think Poetics is probably one of the most read um, of, you know, that's where you start. Like, if you're going to read about psychology, you're going to start with Freud, right? You're going to read about lit literary criticism. This book is probably the one you pick up first, right? 
All right, so that's Aristotle's Poetics. And that, my friends, is everything. Oh, so like I was saying with the Everyman Library, it's all numbered. So I went online, and um, I want to put a shout-out. Sevenroads.org uh, put out a list of a complete serial list since 1991, not 1992, of the Everyman Library. And they they just list them all. All right, so I printed it out, which is probably the point of them putting it up. And they have up to volume 381 in this. I don't know if they've updated it since, but I think there's over 400 and something, close to 500 volumes right now. But what I'm doing is I'm using it as a collector list, and all the yellow ones are the ones that I have. Yeah, so so I, I probably have like 150 of them at least probably. Because most most of the pages I have at least half of half of the books on on that page, right? So, um, anyways, I'm gonna go organize them, and uh, it's good. You can go to sevenroads.org and get the list yourself if you want to collect it. And I'm I'm not sure I haven't, I haven't been to that website in a while. Uh, they may have updated it longer, and there is little little differences between the the uh, you know the North American numbering and the uk numbering of, of the volumes um i do have some uk editions in in my collection but most of them are north american editions obviously uh but some some make their way over here some of the editions make their way over here so so you need to pay attention of a little bit of differences like for example number 17 although it's the number is the same, which is a Turgenev's uh, fathers and sons in the UK, but they call it in the in the US fathers and children for some reason. And there's just little differences that that the list has, right? So, um, like number sixty nine is the sound and the fury, but it was only put out um, in the UK. It wasn't published uh, and put out in the US, so you'd have to import number sixty nine in the collection. Um, number 83, let's say Pushkin's The Captain's Daughter and Other Stories. Um, it's number 83 and it was released only in the UK, but then they put out in number 251, all right? Number 251 is Alexander Pushkin's The Collected Stories. So they had originally um, Pushkin's in, in 81, but they stopped publishing it, right? Number 80. Uh, Sorry, number 83, um, The Captain's Daughter and Other Stories. They stopped printing that and came out with, you know, the collected stories of Pushkin. So yeah, they added it into that, and then they just published a new one. Sorry. Right, so there's little differences that, that they put on this list. Um, but overall, it's pretty, uh, when you get the number, you have the number, whether it's a UK or, or, or an American, you know, North American uh, edition of it, right? So, um, so it's pretty uh, simple. And it's fun to collect, let's say, uh, as well. All right. So, uh, that's everything. Uh, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did leave me a thumbs up, maybe, uh, think of subscribing. I'd appreciate it. And I'll talk to you in my next video and, uh, you have a great day. Bye for now.